All right. Welcome back to the show, Jay. I appreciate you coming back on to talk to me about Stanley Kubrick and his movies. And I've watched all of your documentaries and I've rewatched The Shining in 2001 several <laughs> times now. And uh, Eyes Wide Shut and wow, incredible stuff. In it. And I want to give you some of my thoughts and uh, theories as well, because you're the expert here. And uh, which is really wild. You really started a lot of this uh, analyzation of his films and uh, we have a lot to unpack here, but uh, anyway, how, how are you doing, Jay? I'm doing good. It's really uh, dry here in 8,000 feet. So I apologize for the scratchy throat. No problem. No worries at all. So I know that you explain this in your documentaries, but I think it's important to begin with here is what does the great work mean jay well in uh in alchemy and in art it's um it's a uh process by which causes the transmutation of the participants so you could um say that cathedrals gothic cathedrals were or that way because you would go in and you'd have the incense burning and the Gregorian chants and the light coming through the stained glass window and you know you're a farmer and this is you know this is never seen anything quite like this and and it transmutes you and changes you and for the better that's the key it's for the better art can do both it can be both for the better or for the worse Alex Gray um the great artist Alex Gray went to go see The Exorcist in 1974, had the shit scared out of him uh, as he was walking out of the theater. You know, he said, hey, if you can make great art that scares the hell out of people, then you can make great art that transforms people. And so then he set out with that purpose for the rest of his life. And, and, I, and I truly believe that that's the whole point of really great art is to change the, the viewer. Uh, whether it be paintings or books or movies or whatever. And uh, very few artists ever uh, try to attain that level. So when it, an artist actually attempts even to attempt it is you know, almost always breathtaking. But when they achieve it, as Kubrick did in 2001, A Space Odyssey, then um, that level of greatness is, 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 is open and obvious to everybody. Yeah, I really didn't realize how deep the rabbit hole went on all this stuff. And, uh, you know, through watching your documentaries and others' theories on Kubrick's work, you know, we'd be here for hours just talking about the hundreds, if not thousands of subliminal messages in his films. It's yeah. actually really mind boggling. But the first uh, film that I kind of want to start on here is 2001, A Space Odyssey, because it really seems like uh, Stanley Kubrick was using a lot of rule of three symbolism in 2001 the opening shot of 2001 was the sun and the moon and the earth being aligned and the rule of three is a writing principle that suggests a trio of entities such as events or characters is more harmonious satisfying and effective than other numbers which in kubrick's case in the opening of this film would be the sun moon and the earth and there's an alignment each time the monolith appears in the movie besides in the very beginning. So what do you get from that opening scene in 2001, Jay? How does that opening scene set the tone for the rest of the movie? Well, you know, you'd have to go back to 1968 to understand what that scene did to us. Um, movies just didn't open like that. It's not how they open. They open with, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, people riding towards the camera on their horses or something, but to open it like that, and thus with Thus Spake Zarathustra as your soundtrack, um, it was just about, you know, why God, what what movie is this, you know? And um, and yeah, it, it's it, the, the one of the keys, of course, in alchemy is you have to know your astrology. And every time the monolith appears in the movie, there's a, 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 a an alignment, a solar lunar alignment going on. Uh, except for at the very beginning of the movie where the number one is and that's because the movie itself is the monolith it's got the same shape as the monolith the screen does and um uh kubrick is telling you you are the, the, the movie is 
the reality and the reality is the movie and this movie like the monolith will shape you and change you just like the model shaped and changed the ape men who you know first encountered it and you know it's audacious when you think about how incredible you know this guy's what 38 years old and he's making a movie with you know 10 million dollars in 1968 money and the movie is his most outrageous uh, movie ever made i mean who would make a movie like that they'd never get made today and um i have it on record um the president of mgm was asked in 1967 at the height of the production we're going on for two almost three years still had another year to go and it was a, it was a documentary i saw and he said so what do you think about that crazy science fiction film you got shooting in england and the president of MGM said, oh, I don't really pay attention to what's going on over there. You know, it was just, you know, as a person who worked in the studio system, <laughs> just no way. There's no way. There's no way that your most expensive film isn't something you're watching every day. The, 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 you know, the film that's coming in and listening to it and talking to the director and the producers and making sure everything's on schedule. And he was already by that time, a year and a half behind schedule. And, um, uh, and the guy didn't care. He didn't care that his number one film was a year and a half behind schedule. But, you know, so Kubrick, you know, as I said before, he cut a deal. And, you know, with, with the powers that be. And um, they saw um, they saw the front screen projection in Dr. Strangelove of the B-52 flying over Siberia. And also Siberia through the windows of the B-52, which again, never seen in movie history at that point. It was like, what? You're looking through the windows of the jet, right? And um, and then military couldn't figure out how he did it, of course. And so they came to him. They actually, I think they approached five directors in total. Um, and they decided after interviewing all five directors, these are all big directors at the time, late 50s, early 60s, that only Stanley had the technical acumen to pull off what they wanted, which was a, a, an insurance policy for the Apollo landings, to have somebody film the Apollo landings. That way, if anything went wrong or they couldn't get there or whatever, they had this in the bag. And uh, they went to Stanley, through, probably through Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote the screenplay. And Arthur C. Clarke was rubbing shoulders with everybody at NASA, all the astronauts, and also the Russians, too. And um, uh, I'm sure that he introduced them, and they all became, you know, and, and that's how it worked, came out. And so they made 2001 A Space Odyssey as a R and d for the moon landing. In other words, it was a cover for how are we going to do this? What kind of technology are we going to have to invent or create or reproduce to get this to look real? And since we're shooting a movie about a guy who's going to the moon, we have to develop that technology anyway. So they did. And the Perfect cover. Front screen projection, which they used in the ape scenes and in the moon scenes on 2001 Space Odyssey. And then they used that same thing for the Apollo um, footage and photographs. Uh, essentially a screen behind the actors um, with a stage line that you can see always. And um, and that's the uh, key to the whole thing. And so from, from, from this, we can see that Kubrick is involved in kind of faking the making of a science fiction movie, right? Mm -hmm. So this beginning of the fakery is starting right there. And it keeps going throughout the rest of his career. He's like kind of a, always in a troll fake mode from then on. So the fakery starts, he's acting like he's making 2001, but he's really looking into how to shoot the moon landings. And so he then gets to, uh, you know, say to NASA, I assume, uh, I really don't like uh, being controlled. And uh, I got really controlled while I was shooting Spartacus, and I swear to God that I would never, ever be under the thumb of anyone ever again. If you want me to do this, and you have to guarantee that I will never be under the thumb of anyone ever again. I believe NASA said, yeah, you got carte blanche for the rest of your career, do whatever you want. That wasn't quite true, but and so Stanley then sat down and wrote a transmutational film 
just as the monolith changes the apes, his film was going to change the boomers. Essentially, it's like that's who he was targeting with his acid like uh, montages and things. And so, um, and it worked. The boomers fell for it. We, you know, it was a, it was a dud. Nobody liked it. Uh, uh, Rock Hudson was seen uh, storming out of the showing it in Hollywood going, I have no idea what this movie's about, right? And so everybody gave it thumbs down, is getting bad reviews. Pauline Kael hated it. And then, you know, somebody said, you know, you got to roll a biggie one before you go in. And then we started laying on the floor in front of the seat. So the screen was above us in this gigantic screen, you know, and... Um, and just immersed ourselves into it. And um, and we were changed by it. And we didn't know what was going on, to be honest with you. We just knew something was going on. And um, Kubrick wasn't talking, so we couldn't get it figured out. But I became obsessed with what was going on with that movie. And then later became obsessed with Kubrick after, I believe, it was uh, probably A Clockwork Orange, which pushed me over into becoming completely obsessed with, uh, with Kubrick. And so... So then Kubrick now, in the late 60s, early 70s, he's now developed uh, the reputation as one of the best filmmakers in the world. Uh, that got sealed with Clockwork Orange and then Barry Lyndon, which whether you liked Barry Lyndon or not, you, ha you had to admit it was an amazingly shot film. So Kubrick had now done pretty much everything he wanted by 74. He had made his... Um, war film, his ultimate anti-war film in Paths of Glory. He made his satire, his dark satire in Dr. Strangelove. He made the ultimate science fiction film. He made the ultimate film about mind control with the Clockwork Orange. And he did the <laughs> ultimate period piece with Barry Lyndon. And he was kind of spent. Yeah. He was spent. He didn't know really where to go, what to do. But he knew he had to cement his legacy. That was super important. And he knew that he was not a... Um, He's what, what you call a temporary filmmaker. He's not like Brian De Palma, running from one project to another, making one film after another. Kubrick was, you know, not that kind. He's more like Quentin Tarantino. I'm going to take three years off here before I decide what I'm going to do next. And those are your best filmmakers, the ones that are, put a lot of space in between their films, I think, anyway. And so he began looking for a property to buy and to make. And he began reading every book and everything coming out. And his secretary said that he would go into his office and she would wait. And about every seven or eight minutes, she'd hear the book, a book slam against the wall as Kubrick rejected one book after another, right? And at the end of the day, she'd go and pick up 30 books that were on the floor um, and put them away. And then one day he went in to read The Shining and she waited for that familiar bump against the wall, the book being thrown and there was no bump. And uh, then he came out about three hours later and he said, I found what I need and um, proceeded to buy the rights to the book, The Shining. And um, of course, you know, Stephen King is peeing in his pants that Stanley Kubrick going to make his film. And, you know, he go walking around the country bragging everybody. Oh, all right, Stanley, the guy who made 2000 ones making my film. Right. And, and, um, and I got to be honest with you, I'm not a real big fan of Stephen King. I, I he's, The Dead Zone was a good book. And, you know, but The Shining is not really a very good book. But that's not why Stanley bought it. Stanley bought The Shining and made The Shining because he's trying to seal his legacy. He wanted to find the right pop vehicle, something that he could attract a big actor to so that it would make money because he had, wanted to make money. But then he wanted to intertwine in internecine plot lines and twists and visuals, a whole other narrative um, that if he told it in public, you know, it would probably cause the film to not be put out. But because he did it this way and mastered it as a Stephen King novel, he was able to get away with it. And I'm not just talking about the moon landings, which he did every time he deviates from the Stephen King novel, he is telling you about how he worked on the Apollo project uh, and tried to hide it from his wife and his family. And by the way, Stephen King, through a third party, has told me through this third party that he thinks I'm right about all this, all of this. He thinks the whole my whole theory is absolutely correct. And he had many conversations with Stanley, so he would know more than me. So anyway, 
So when you get into the the shining and the, the subtext of the shining stuff gets really wild you got sexual subtext in there you got um, yeah genocide of native american subtext you got holocaust subtext you got the beatles subtext 9 11 subtext jfk subtext with barry, barry nelson the manager of the overlook which is right. the first thing i noticed whenever i was re-watching uh the shining was that they set barry nelson's character to look almost identical to jfk yeah and it was interesting in in the book jack wants to kill that guy it's at the very beginning of the book and and he hates him and he wants to kill him which is interesting because that character if he is jfk he dies but um yeah and uh, barry nelson now has a toupee that looks just like jack's hair and he's sitting in front of an eagle of course the the craft that landed on the moon was the eagle and um so, uh, yeah, there's all these illusions. Uh, the Shining is also uh, Stanley's 11th film. Again, this is his legacy. He's very co cognizant that this is my 11th film. And I'm the guy that faked Apollo 11. So I'm going to use this, my, uh, my 11th film, to tell you the story about what I went through making Apollo 11. And Apollo 11 is his, his word for the whole project. The entire project. He just called it Apollo 11. A11, as he says. A11, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Right? All, all Apollo 11 work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. Makes Stanley a dull boy. And so, when Jack arrives at the, at the uh, Overlook, you know, he's all bright and shiny and everything. But by the end, He's got a growth of beard. He's aged and everything. And if you look at pictures of Stanley at the beginning of 2001, he was all bright and shiny, wearing clean clothes and everything. And by the end, he was a complete wreck. Complete, looked like he hadn't shaved in days and stains all over his clothing. And people said he wasn't taking a bath near the end because he was so busy trying to finish it and didn't have time to wash. And, 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 and so The Shining is Stanley's most autobiographical film. And it was also King's most autobiographical book. And, um, and King really came out after the movie came out uh, and chastised Stanley and said it was a terrible movie and he hated it and all of this. And then in 97, King got himself a chance to make the movie uh, in the uh, miniseries, The Shining, in 97, shot in Colorado. And um, we saw how he fell over and smashed his face into the ground. One of the worst uh, things ever written. Uh, I got one bit of news for you, Stephen King. Bushes aren't scary. All right. They're not scary. So it's really interesting, too, is because the, the hedge maze isn't in the book. It's like haunted bushes and stuff. Yeah. But in the movie, it's, it's the, the maze. The maze. Yeah. Yeah, and then Kubrick realized that was the dumbest thing ever. And so he made the maze, which was a lot better idea. Over and over, when you compare the two, the Kubrick version stands out way out. And yeah, um, there's so many uh, subtexts of child abuse and um, uh, 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 like archons, spirit forms that get inside you and change you. Um, the house somehow being really important. Like there's something important about the house and the managers of the house and, um, and, and the whole thing. And, 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 and there's a new theory that's come out, which I don't want to give too much time to, but I think it, it does bear some uh, repeating. And that's the Wendy theory. Now the Wendy theory is a really interesting theory because do I believe in the Wendy theory? No, not necessarily, but, I know Stanley, and if there's one thing that Stanley would have tried to do, it was tried to find a way to explain the overlook and the ghosts without resorting to, to supernatural uh, 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 positions. So the Wendy theory says that as soon as she, that she's crazy, that she's the one that abused Danny, and that um, uh, every time that she's in a conversation, things are being moved around in the room. They are. Every time that Wendy is in a conversation, things are being moved around from shot to shot. It's like, what's going on here? And the Wendy theory says that's because Wendy's schizophrenic. And uh, and so she's seeing reality different every time. And that when she finally hits Jack with the baseball bat, she kills him. And she drags him outside into the snow 
um, where he freezes to death. And for the rest of the movie, it's a fantasy conjured up in her schizophrenic mind. Now, I don't know if this is true or not, but I'll tell you what, Stanley would do something like that. He would. He would do something just like that. He would try to find some way to not bring in ghosts and to find some way to practically explain what was really going on here. So I don't know if the Wendy theory is true or not, but um, it's an interesting theory. Yeah, but I actually I, like I actually like the Wendy theory, and I also like the the two jacks theory too. I don't know if you've which one? Uh, looked the two jacks theory, where there's Jack the writer, and then there's like the actual Jack, and then midway through the film, whenever he goes in to look at the maze, the model of the maze in the um, in the movie in the film on the table, he walks over and looks into the maze, which is another really interesting thing about this film is because stanley kubrick uses different transitions they're they're normally fades he normally always fades into his transitions but this transition is different right whenever jack goes and looks at the model of the maze he looks into the maze and then he sees wendy and danny outside playing in the maze so it almost seems like he's looking at wendy and Danny from inside of the hotel room whenever they're already outside. It's different. It's a different kind of transition than um, uh, Kubrick uses in the rest of the film. All the other transitions are uh, fades Normal. and dissolves. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah that, and that's one of the spookiest scenes in the movie. And actually one of the strangest shots in Kubrick's entire work, body of work, that yeah. shot there. It's, it's jaw dropping. I remember seeing it in the theater and being like, really blown away by what I exactly I was seeing. And of course, that's exactly when Jack throws the tennis ball against the wall, right? Mm -hmm. Beginning the that active scene. So that's an interesting theory, like a new Jack came over and took over. And, and of course, yeah. um, so we have, you know, um, we have uh, uh, all these different things put in. But one of the things that he put in that most people don't realize was there was a, a couple of books that came out by a guy named, I think it was Willis O'Brien. And it was about subliminal advertising. And these books were all about how advertisers were water, uh, uh, using uh, water paint and stuff to put in sex things like penises and breasts and stuff inside like drinks and ice and drinks in you know whiskey ads or whatever and i actually talked to somebody in the uh in the new york uh advertising world at the time he said yeah we're doing that of course we're doing anything we can to get an edge right and then they tell the advertisers they're doing it to get an edge so Kubrick became fascinated by this and so he also added that layer in to the shining so there's all this subliminal stuff going on that you're not really aware of while you're watching it. For instance, <clears throat> yeah, Disney was a pro at doing that as well. They would put sexual material into the covers of their uh, VHS tapes and their DVDs and stuff as well. Yeah, and Kubrick was a, a huge fan of Disney. It has to be said. He actually considered Disney to be one of the few real artists that uh, Hollywood had created. And in fact, he remade um, Pinocchio. That's what uh, uh, artificial intelligence is, AI. It was a, it's a remake of Pinocchio, only it's a robot instead of a, of a puppet. And, um, and that was his homage to, uh, he had two homages to, um, to, um, to Disney in his career. One was Pinocchio. Um, uh, well, I guess he only did one. No, a AI. And then um, yeah, uh, he dressed up, oh, he was one of the big actors, uh, uh, not Peter Ustinov. Um, can't remember his name. Anyway, in Disney's Pinocchio, a guy picks up a whole bunch of little boys and takes them to Pleasure Island. That guy was drawn in the animation to look just like, I'm going to forget his name, a famous Hollywood actor who was known for his predilections. Okay. <laughs> He was later hired to be in Spartacus, in which Kubrick dressed him up to look just like the character in Pinocchio, put the same kind of wig on him and, and the whole thing. And that's the first homage to um, Pinocchio. And then the second homage is, of course, trying to remake AI, which, of course, he didn't. Steven Spielberg took it over, and that's a whole other story. But um, 
So, and of course, there's Disney characters in um, The Shining. They're on the walls, the dwarfs, and and all of that. And um, so, uh, yeah, that's interesting because there's a few con. Well, what some people would say is continuity errors, absolutely. and uh, one of them is when Wendy comes to Jack and he's doing his writing the first time. There's clearly a chair placed behind Jack and the shot transfers to Wendy for a second. And then when it goes back to Jack, the chair is gone. But I've people have researched the, the crap out of that. But the thing that they don't mention in uh, any of the documentaries that I've watched about it is that the chair reappears again in the next scene. That's so right. I think that that whole chair thing was a legit continuity error. Now, there's some other ones like... Uh, when Danny is brushing his teeth in the apartment in Boulder, you see some stickers like you were talking about the three drawers. Why I think the one is uh, dopey. Uh, and then whenever the scene transfers, the the sticker is gone too. But I think the, the one with the chair was a, a straight up mistake by Stanley Kubrick because it reappears again in the next shot when it transfers back to Wendy. Okay, that's good. I've been told by one of his top assistants that that was a continuity error. Yes. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. So Kubrick does make continuity errors. Um, not very many. Um, it's hard to believe that he would be that sloppy, but he, but he could be, he probably did it and then just said, Oh, what the hell? It's so weird. I'll leave it in. Right. I mean, he, he did like to leave shots in that were incongruous in his films. So, so the shining is, you know, it's got all the sexual innuendo. It's not really a scary movie to me at all. The scariest scene is when Wendy finds the book with the same sentence written over and over that's that's scary i gotta admit um i to me the the creepiest scene is the scene with danny and jack on the bed where he's promising he'll never hurt him uh it's it's just pure creep i don't know and i never i never understood why danny was so afraid of jack in that scene because he's downstairs with wendy what they're watching tv which is another thing that's interesting none of the tvs in the film have any cables to them yep. right so they're basically all unplugged right yes. which is, it kind of gets into my theory that i'm going to talk about here later on but whenever um danny asks wendy to if he, he can go upstairs and get his fire truck out of the room he he's like really he's acting really strange like he's afraid of jack and then when jack asks him to come over and and sit with him first before he goes and gets his fire truck he's not embracing jack at all he's like sitting there on his lap with his like arms down completely which i think kind of ties into the theory that maybe danny was somehow abused by jack because earlier whenever they first get to the hotel room jack's reading that playgirl uh magazine whenever allman and his assistant comes up to jack and he throws a playgirl uh, magazine down onto the chair which yeah. you know people have you know come out and said that there's they've actually got the screenshot of the actual playgirl magazine and it involves like pedophilia should, should and like all these different things people who sold magazines in the 70s said that 95 percent of the people that bought playgirl were uh, gay guys yeah because it's a gay guy um, magazine. Playboy is yeah. a, a dude magazine and Playgirl's a, a gay guy magazine because it's all yeah, the dudes. In there. That's right. And um, and uh, um, so uh, what I believe is there's the scene uh, right before, um, I can't remember, uh, it was when they're watching the Roadrunner cartoon. In the back, there's a, a, a teddy bear in the corner with its legs spread. And there's a fire truck in between the teddy bear's legs with the ladder on the fire truck going up right and clearly Kubrick is giving the teddy bear a hard on and it's so obvious right and so I believe that fire truck which is there's only two words in the English language that begin with f and end with uck and um, I believe the word fire truck is the code word for Jack's abuse and so when she he goes up to get the fire truck that's why he's you know, filled with, you know, all sorts of trepid, scared and all that and music swelling and all of that because he knows what's going on. And then Jack knows that he knows and then tries to assure him that he's not going to hurt him, but in the most um, insincere way imaginable. And um, and so, yeah, there's a, there does appear to be a serious threat of Jack on Danny. 
Yeah. Also, course. another another continuity error that I forgot to mention earlier was when Danny is playing on the floor with his toys on the uh, hexagonal carpet pattern. Yeah. Uh, whenever he's uh, sitting there and then he stands up and he has the Apollo 11 uh, shirt on and then, you know, he goes to uh, room 237. But anyway, whenever he stands up, the hexagonal carpet pattern changes. It flips. It, yeah, it reverses, which I don't know if that's a continuity error or not. Uh, no, where they just, you would have where to they... fold up the entire carpet and put it back the other way. There's no other way around it. Or I had to put another piece of carpet over the other one, but there's no way. You would have to pull that up and, and turn it around. So it couldn't be a continuity error, right? But what it is, it's a signal. And the signal is, okay, now you're going to get the big download of what I did, you know, because that's when you see the Apollo 11 shirt going to room 237 and uh, the mysterious moon room, uh, with uh, which is where he faked everything, and um, and by the way, um, we now know the the big question for me since I put this theory out about fifteen years ago by people who don't like my theory, and I totally understand it, is you know the, you ha obviously had to have a gigantic set to do the moon shots, and there's no way that Pinewood. Studios had a set that big, and they didn't. I know they didn't. There were no sets that big anywhere. But we now know that an eyewitness had come forth and said that he saw Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong at the Blimp Factory right outside Leeds, um, England, in 1969. And so that got everybody looking into this blimp uh, hanger. And this blimp hanger is literally the size of like five football fields. It's got a 250 foot ceiling. Um, it's now used as a set. All the Batman movies, they built Gotham inside that set. Christopher Nolan did. Inside that blimp hanger, he built Gotham. And so it's being used all, it's been used ever since. Um, uh, I believe Kubrick shot the moon landings there. And um, and so now we oh, and it's, it's about 42 minutes away from Kubrick's house, just exactly what Kubrick would want. A short drive, work all day, go home, sleep in my own bed. And so I'm pretty sure the blimp hanger is where he shot uh, the the moon landings. And the and, and I believe that he probably shot those after he finished 2001. So he finished 2001 in March, April of 68. Uh, yeah, in 68, and then I believe he shot the moon landings like April to September 68, something like that, in at the blimp hangar. And um, and so uh so the shining becomes his confession and his legacy film, the film that's gonna make him uh he wanted people to just talk about it endlessly. He would have been so happy that room 237 had been made because that's what he wanted. He wanted and I believe, by the way, that all the theories in room 237 are right. I believe it is about the Holocaust. I believe it is about America. I believe it is about all of those things, all building up to Operation Paperclip, bringing in the Germans from, from Germany to do this. Because uh, Kubrick must have been floored by all the Germans that were in NASA. They're like, what the hell is going on here? Right. And um, uh, uh, and so uh, and, and what's really ironic about it is it's the one film that didn't win any awards. Every film you ever made won some kind of award at, at the Academy. They just ignored The Shining, completely ignored it. Didn't get any awards at all, nothing. And I, I have to tell you, I don't think it's a very good film. I mean, I think he tried to put too much into it. I think he got too many layers going. And uh, as just a, a person in the theater, I couldn't, identify with anybody i couldn't identify with danny or jack or definitely not shelly duvall and so in a ways i think it's his biggest letdown it's it's an interesting film don't get me wrong in, in on all levels but uh it's not as good as the other ones not as good as full metal jacket or eyes wide shut or 2001 or clockwork orange 
You know, it's just not. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Absolutely. Because the first time that I watched it too, I was like, what is this? What is going on? But I want to get into a little bit of this uh, information with the, the gold room and Lloyd, right? Because I found this really interesting, Jay, and it lines up with your analysis too. So right after the very first meeting with Jack and Lloyd in the gold room, the very next scene after Wendy comes in telling Jack about Danny is Halloran in his hotel room in Florida watching TV, right? Yep. And the newscaster's name on the TV is Glenn Ricker. So I started Googling, right? And I came across this gentleman named Lloyd Breckner. And Lloyd Breckner was the inventor of the shortwave radio systems and was instrumental in forming NASA and later on in data collection for the uh, World Wide Web and would take trips around the world to set up radio stations. And the most notable one was going with Admiral Byrd to Antarctica to set up radio stations, right, which is another hardcore connection to your theory about NASA and uh, the moon landings in this film. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, uh, the uh, you know, there's it's, it's, it, the whole thing is 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 amazing, and um, I think in the end, you know, Kubrick Kubrick wanted to make a horror film, but you know, he faked the making of the King novel so he could show you how he faked the moon landing, and and I think that's what's going on there, and. He didn't really give a, a, a twit whether you liked it or not. He was telling some, a completely other story. What about uh, sexuality, too? I mean, mm -hmm. there's all Which is another thing, another thing that I saw, too, that I don't think very many people have caught that uh, I didn't see in any of the documentaries or anything that I've watched so far. I'm sure someone has seen it and they've put it out there. But when Jack is in the gold room speaking with Lloyd, he gets up. It's the second time that he's in the gold room. He gets up and Mr. Grady's coming around and he's getting ready to spill the drinks on him, which I still can't figure out what that substance that he spills on Jack is supposed to be. It looks like hollandaise sauce or eggs or something, but it doesn't make any sense why he would have hollandaise sauce or eggs in uh, champagne glasses. But there's a lady that walks past right before this happens and she has a bloody handprint on her ass like a straight up bloody handprint which i, I didn't notice until i was rewatching it last night actually and i was like huh that's really interesting because it doesn't go along with that party that's going on there in the gold room like no one is like that they're all dressed up and like fancy and this lady walks by and she has a a bloody red handprint on her ass i, I not, never caught that you ever um see the um the the guys that take the shining and they split screen it and then they play it forwards and then they play it backwards and how yeah. the tunes all match each other like it's incredible it is really incredible i thought about maybe trying to do do that with uh 2001 a space odyssey too because i feel like that 2001 would almost line up identical just like the shining and there's another theory to that too when something is like perfection like when something is perfect you can watch it backwards and forwards simultaneously and it lines up right that's yeah. like a old you know running theory but there's only a few really uh supernatural things that actually happen and i want to get your thoughts on this too jay because this is important as well that are really truly unexplainable uh the first one which is we've kind of already touched on and discussed a little bit is the ball being rolled uh toward danny when he's on the floor and playing with his toys what do you think is going on there how do you think that that ball uh, rolled toward Danny that made him get up and then go into uh, room 237. It, it's what Lloyd says, the bartender, it's the house. So the house is, you know, in control of everything. Uh, Jack threw the tennis ball into the house and disappeared. And now the house has the ball and it's going to use it to entice Danny into uh, telling the truth to the audience. And so, you know, the, the ball rolls into the, hexagonal uh launch pad as if it's the house is saying you do you want to play right and then danny gets up and plays and what's interesting of course is the very first word he says is mom like what is mom around right what's going on here which is a strange thing because why would mom let their son play alone up and uh, upstairs you know i don't know there's just some things in the movie that don't make sense but yeah that's 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 a supernatural so that's what the house gets to be supernatural in The Shining. The Overlook gets to be supernatural. 
but nothing else really gets to be supernatural. Uh, we have to ask ourselves who opened the door to the freezer. Yes, that's the other one. That's the only yeah. other one that I've really seen that is any kind of supernatural feeling is, uh, which is super interesting is when Jack being let out of the pantry by Mr. Grady, which is an unseen force, yeah. uh, which is also really strange, Jay, because in that scene, you don't see the hallucination or the imagery of Mr. Grady, right? It, Mr. Grady is could technically be in Jack's head in that scene because he's talking to him inside yeah. his head. And all the other times, uh, well, the time two times that he talked to Lloyd in the gold room and the other time that he met Mr. Grady, he spilled the, um, you know, the substance on him and went to the bathroom. Those were all visual experiences. But the second time he meets Mr. Grady, it's in his head. Yeah. Right? And that really got me uh, thinking about this uh, hardcore. But what do you think of that scene uh, being, of Jack being let out of the pantry by a uh, supposed supernatural force? I, I don't know what to make of it. I, I would guess that's the house again that let him out. And um, uh, Grady somehow represents the house. And the house is this, um, uh, the hotel is a cauldron of uh, archonic spirits that have gathered there because of all the bad things that have happened in the past. And um, uh, Jack doesn't have the alcohol to escape into anymore. So he's now seeing them. Whereas that's why they call alcohol spirits because if you see a ghost and you have a drink, the ghost will go away because you don't see it anymore. But when you don't have the alcohol, now, oh, you know, it's coming at you all the time. And so I think that also has a, a place in it. And, uh, um, and I thought that was really done well. But uh, again, you have to wonder about the Wendy theory, uh, at the, the whole ending. It does seem like it's all Wendy's hallucination, the whole thing, from the beginning to the end. So I don't know. Uh, I really like the Wendy theory. I would love to talk to Stanley about it. Um, I suspect it might be correct. Okay, so I, I'm going to give you my theory here and, and what okay. I've kind of uh, accumulated through watching it and, and watching other people's theories and other people's documentary. And I haven't heard anyone really talk about this. And I think that it's really interesting. I'm excited to get your take on it here because there's something really interesting that I found, which is the first time that Danny sees the twins, right? He's in the game room. And if you zoom in on that poster on the left side of the door, it's a ski poster. And some have said it's a Minotaur, right? But I don't really care about the Minotaur. The Minotaur doesn't, you know, in my theory, doesn't, you know, do anything for me. I care more about the words on the poster, right? And at the bottom of the poster, it says monarch, yep. right? Which, what do we know about monarch? It's associated with MK Ultra, And one of the purposes of MK Ultra is to supplant thoughts, ideas, visions, hallucinations, voices into the subject's head using trauma and drugs. So Kubrick could be trying to let us know that the hallucinations and the visions that Jack, Danny, and sometimes Wendy toward the end of the movie are experiencing is an MK Ultra experiment. And also when Halloran is talking to Danny in the beginning of the film, he's basically telling Danny, you're going to experience things here, right? But know that they're not real, which Danny refers to later on when he sees the twins in the hallway saying, remember, he's talking to Tony, his uh, imaginary friend. He said, remember what Mr. Halloran said, uh, they're just like pictures in a book. They aren't real, which also confirms my theory about this MK Ultra experiment going on at the, uh, at the Overlook Hotel. And also the assistant to Stuart Allman looks strikingly similar to Sidney Gottlieb, which was the head of the MK Ultra programs. Yeah. And it's just so interesting that the first time the viewer sees anything strange in the film, it's the Grady sisters and it's seen by Danny in the games room, right? And there's a poster right there beside the twins to the left that says Monarch, implying that the visions are 
of some sort of MK Ultra. I mean, think about it. They're isolated up on a mountain for the winter. Just the three of them, no way off the mountain because of the storm. Perfect scenario for a MK Ultra type of experiment. And also explains Jack's behavior throughout the film and the progression of his delusions. And they were only they only ever seemed to have any hallucinations when they were alone, right? Never together, which makes even more sense. And the second time, Jack speaks with Mr. Grady is in the uh, pantry, like I was speaking about earlier, and you don't see the hallucination of Mr. Grady, Jack speaking to him again in his head, implying that it's some sort of V2K, MK Ultra type of voices telling him what he needs to do. It's it's very subtle, but uh, I think it's there. W what do you think about that? Yeah, I think there's a lot, a lot to that. I've actually heard that theory a little bit already before. I can't remember where it was years ago, but um, uh, it would be the, so. The purpose of the experiment would be: can you get this guy to kill his family? Yeah. Right. So that would be the whole point of the MK Ultra experiment, and of course, it, he almost did. But uh, Monarch could also be one Archon too. All right. So. Um, but Monarch, it's very interesting that he used that word. Uh, the late 70s, we were just beginning to find out about the mind control programs for the CIA. Uh, I'm sure Kubrick was up on it. Two of his films are about mind control, Clockwork Orange and uh, Full Metal Jacket. So, I mean, it, it isn't surprising that he would make a third one about mind control. I'm sure that he sure that he was extremely fascinated by the fact that he could make a film that could influence millions and millions of people and found that really fascinating and um so yeah i think there's a lot of a lot of truth in the fact that this could be a mind control operation of some sort and then also with you know uh, when when halloran called from the police station from florida yeah. Right. He why does he repeat the fact that there's a family up on the mountain? Right. When the police already knew that they were up there from Wendy calling them earlier in the film. Right. Yeah. And the policeman telling them to keep the radio on the entire time from here on out. Right. When yeah. Halloran calls, it's like the police had no idea that a family was even staying up there. It's like Wendy never even made that call. So it's odd and interesting that the policeman doesn't mention to Halloran that they had already been trying to contact him because I believe by that point Jack had already went to the radio and ripped apart the radio and while he was ripping apart the radio the police were trying to contact Wendy at that time yeah yeah it doesn't make any sense at all actually but it would if it was a secret mind control operation yeah Exactly. And also Wendy not being susceptible to the hallucinations, right? Until the end after she's been traumatized by Jack. And that, that was referenced when Jack is talking to Grady inside the pantry in Jack's head. Grady says, if you remember, Grady says, Wendy is much stronger than we anticipate, right? Meaning that she's much stronger mentally and not susceptible to the MK ultra monarch mind control hallucinations. And the first hallucination she sees is the man in the bear costume, right? After she's been traumatized by Jack, after she hits Jack with that baseball bat and drags him to the pantry. She uh, that's the first hallucination she sees is the man in the bear costume upstairs. And then when she goes downstairs, she sees Halloran dead. Right. Yeah. And immediately after she turns around, she sees the guy holding the uh, glass of champagne or alcohol or whatever it was with the split in his head. Right. right. And to me, that's symbolizing the mind fracturing process that Wendy has just gone through and her mind is about to be taken over because we know that's how MK Ultra works is through right. trauma and compartmentalization of the brain. I like the theory. It's a good one. I think you ought to write it down. It's a good theory. But then it also, you know, it, it, if the theory also explains a lot of things that fits into your hypothesis as too, uh, as well too, Jay. Like, you know, it also explains the all of the World War II Nazi symbolism throughout the film and the subliminal messages of the Holocaust because MK Ultra started in Germany during World War right. II with Joseph Mengele. And, and maybe the 
maybe that's Kubrick. He's trying to tell us, uh, you know, that he's trying to implant new thoughts and ideas and images into people's heads subliminally. And yeah. that's what the purpose of the film was to do. Let people know that they're being MK ultra MK ultra. Right. And, uh, also it, if it's true that he did fake the the moon landings, which I am in agreement with your theory, then he would have been responsible for the biggest worldwide MK Ultra project ever through the TV by faking the moon landing. Yeah, I just think about the power rush that must have given him, right? To know that he faked out the whole world, 60 million people believed it, and um, it was all fake, and now he's making a movie, and he's going to reveal all this stuff in it. And he did. And so, you know, all the programs that came over with the Germans were MK Ultra and the NASA Operation Paperclip. He's kind of brushing on all of them in the movie in one way or another. It's fascinating. And also the the Beatles, because uh, I know that you have a, a really good theory on what happened with the Beatles. There's so much Beatles symbolism in there when... Um, they're walking around the outside of the hotel and they, they look straight up like, like the Beatles, like on Abbey road, like that, uh, that album cover of Abbey, Abbey road. They have almost the same clothes on. They're walking in the same kind of way. And then I, I believe that whenever they're getting ready to walk across the street at the end of that scene, there's a car that's about to hit them. And that car is the same model that John Lennon wrecked during the the making of Abbey Road. Oh, I did not know that. Really. It's also interesting that there's a Volkswagen behind them on the Abbey Road cover with the license plate 28 if. Mm -hmm. And of course, Paul McCartney would have been 28 at the time of Abbey Road. And uh, I would say that a, a person like me and probably Stanley who does, it takes a lot of photographs and knows human faces and everything. He would have, he would have seen right away that, that Paul McCartney had been switched out. Also, they had been talking to Kubrick about Kubrick directing the Hobbit and the Beatles were going to be mm -hmm. the four Hobbits. And, uh, and of course, thank goodness that, uh, that project fell apart. But, um, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, there's a lot going on. That's all I can say. Yeah. There is really a lot going on. And I done a little research, which is just a, you know, a rumor, but uh, that Stephen King got the title or inspiration for The Shining from John Lennon's post Beatles album from the song Instant Karma. Yeah. Is that correct to your, to your knowledge? Where I did I think not know that. I know the original title was Shine. And, he, and that song has We All Shine On. So yeah. I know they made him change it from shine to shining because shine had racial overtones that King didn't know about. It's apparently a used, it's a word they use in the South for black people in those days. Mm -hmm. So he had to change it to the shining. But again, you know, you never know where, where all that comes from. <clears throat> yeah. And I, I think that, uh, that hasn't been, uh, I don't think that that's been confirmed that that's where he got the, the title of the movie from, but I think it's apparent that Stephen King was a big Beatles fan though, right? Yeah, he probably was. I'm sure we all were. Although yeah. I, nowadays I have no idea why. So why to, well, I think we already kind of covered it, but I think it's important to mention why room two, three, seven, and, and why change the room to 237 from 217 in the film because they also did that in uh the doctor sleep what in film they kept it 237 and in, in doctor sleep did you see uh doctor sleep yeah i can't say i cared much for it um yeah. not a big fan of that director um but uh yeah room 237 was because the the mean distance between the earth and the moon at the time of the making of 2001 was 237,000 miles, not 237,002, exactly 237,000. And so the whole scene 
of Danny in the hallway is the, he's up the launch pad, little trucks there filling up the fuel and everything. And then he launches after the ball rolls in, you see the rocket taking off. And then Danny flies down the hallway towards room 237 where the door is open. Right. And then he goes into room 237 and you can see the, uh, it says on their moon, uh, room and then NO, which is number in those days. They don't use that anymore. But that's an anagram for moon room. Um, and this is the moon room. This is the room where he did everything and where everything needs to be kept secret from Wendy. That's the big thing. You've got to keep it all secret from your wife because if she finds out, she's going to end up like hollering. Uh, and so this is the whole premise of the movie. So when Wendy discovers that Jack has written a book for weeks and weeks and weeks, which is just the same sentence over and over, which is a re revealing about Apollo 11 work, um, you know, she tells Jack that we have to get out of here. That this is this is really dangerous. What's going on here? You're, you know, you're working on a secret project, and I just discovered it, right? And and then Jack says, "Well, do you know even have the remote idea what a contract is? Do you know I have to keep my word to my employer, right?" And this is probably the exact argument they had when she found out about it, right? She's like, "Get out of here! Get out of it!" And he's like, "I can't. I'm stuck. I made the agreement. I'm in here forever." And uh, I believe he eventually came to regret making the moon landings, by the way. And then what's your theory on Jack killing uh, Halloran whenever he comes back to the hotel room and he flies in from Well, Florida? I've always wondered that. But now that I think about your uh, um, theory, I'm wondering if Halloran isn't the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the field agent for the experiment. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, when the experiment goes wrong, he has to enter into the deal. Right. And but Jack is so far gone crazy at that point from all the MK Ultra stuff that, you know, he does in Hollering, which is ridiculous. And Hollering can hear Danny talk from 3000 miles away. And uh, yet he can't know that, you know, why didn't Danny tell him, hey, dad's running around with an axe. You know, it, <laughs> well, it just doesn't make any sense. If you actually think about the whole Hollering thing, it doesn't really make any sense. And then also the the assistant to Allman in the office, he he seems like he's like a CIA agent yeah. because he doesn't treat Jack like well. He's like really impartial to Jack. He's kind of like sitting back and observing, and he has like really weird looks on his face. And whenever Allman asked him to take their luggage up to, uh, you remember this in the in the lobby. Whenever Allman asked the assistant to uh, take their luggage up to the room he's like fine so it's fine and just like walks away like really quick he's he's like an ominous kind of presence and you know yeah. if my theory is you know kind of uh correct and it is kind of an mk ultra experiment it would make sense that he would kind of be in charge of you know this kind of experiment that they're doing yeah and then his assistant of course I don't think he even has one line in the whole movie. He's like the handler. He's there to to assess the situation, uh, give a, give his opinion on what's going on, and because otherwise the guy doesn't make any sense. This is it's the most ridiculous waste of casting I've ever seen. So it never made any sense. And uh, uh, so you know, I, I, I'm tending towards uh, liking this MK Ultra stuff. And then it also makes sense toward the, the, the very ending of the film after uh, Jack is, uh, he's frozen outside and he's dead. And then it zooms in on the, to the pictures on the wall. And then it zooms up and you see Jack uh, there on the picture on the wall. And I think the date was July 4th, 1927. I could be wrong about the year. Um and it shows him and then it, it fades and I, I and it fades and there's like a little mustache that uh yeah. that goes on to to jack's face there but i think that that what stanley was trying to do with that whole scenario again if this is a mk ultra type of experiment it's him symbolizing that this has happened several times before and that they do this almost every year during the winter season they have people come in here and they they're not aware that this is an experiment and different scenarios 
play out the exact way that it played out with Jack, Wendy, and Danny being there. Not necessarily you, that, that would be again like the Wendy theory. That would be something that would really appeal to Stanley. An experiment where apparitions using projectors and stuff could be created and you know all designed to drive a guy to kill his, his wife and kids right and um even actors coming in acting like they're the bartender um the whole thing designed just as a, a complete mind screw and uh so i think there's a lot there's a lot to this that theory i mean i hadn't really thought about it. i did hear it years ago from somewhere but uh, I think there is a lot to that theory. It certainly explains a lot of the aberrant behavior. Uh, that's kind of disappointing because I thought I was one of the first people to put all that together. But it, well, you, it's you, all, you it's all put your name on it because I can't remember <laughs> who it was that told me. But years ago, somebody said, oh, I think it was an MK Ultra experiment. I mean, oh, that's right. I never thought about that. But I was aware of Monarch, and I know about Project Monarch. And I thought it was odd that he put that in there. Yeah, the most of the people that I've seen that, that referenced it, um, they just brushed over the, the Monarch name underneath the poster. They were focused on the actual poster itself and what was on the poster, not the, the title that was underneath it. They were equating it to the, the a Minotaur, which Stanley Kubrick does put a lot of Minotaur symbolism throughout his films. Whenever Jack's staring out the window and he had, at Danny and Wendy, he has that Minotaur kind of look and then also in Full Metal Jacket. Uh, there's that Minotaur kind of look going on there. And then also in A Clockwork Orange as well, you know, there's that kind of Minotaur symbolism. But I, I didn't think that that really, you know, answered any questions about it. And then I, when I saw the Monarch, I was like, holy shit, this is just a big, huge MK Ultra Monarch experiment that they got going on up here during the winter season at the Overlook Hotel. Yeah, and then you know about the... Um uh it, it was in uh, uh laurel canyon the uh building the over it overlooked uh, uh la it was a studio and they used to use mk ultra uh build mk ultra stuff there david um my old friend david oh man david don't let me forget you the late yeah. great david anyway he wrote all about laurel canyon and he was a good friend of mine uh he died right after he wrote about laurel canyon and there was a, I think it was called Lookout Mountain, uh, which is very similar to Overlook. Yeah, it was Lookout Mountain. And it was a movie studio. Ronald Reagan would go there and do voiceovers. And and they did MK Ultra stuff. And and, and uh, uh, the theory is, is that the hippie movement uh, that started in Laurel Canyon was started by the MK Ultra people to change society. And that they use Lookout Mountain. What's interesting about that is, is that Kubrick was in L.A. from for all of the time of uh, making Spartacus. So he was there for like a year, right at the top of that Lookout Mountain being at the top of its MK Ultra filmmaking game. So it's very likely he actually visited uh, Lookout Mountain and um, and uh, um, and knew about all of that. Uh, again, this kind of ties in with the Beatles and all the, all the other stuff. Uh, if you ever want to uh, read a, a incredible series, read the, the Laurel Canyon series by I can't remember his name. His name is David. <laughs> but there's yeah, also David. experiments that I've researched too, where there would be groups of people that they would unwittingly dose them with LSD as a part. Of, some one of them was a LSD aerosol that they sprayed into a group of people at a party for an MK Ultra experiment. And then there's another one, I can't remember the name of it right off the top of my head, but it involved uh, a bunch of these CIA agents at a uh, gathering and Sidney Gottlieb put LSD into their alcoholic drinks. And then one man, I forget his name, I'd have to look it up, but he committed suicide yeah, he after. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. No, it's just very likely, and um, uh, uh, it, that 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 your theory is right. And um, so, I mean, I don't know. It would be you almost need to make a film about your theory because it's that interesting. Because I could add a whole bunch now that I'm thinking about it. Of weird stuff that doesn't make any sense. Yes. That's a kind of mind control operation. That's Again, why I couldn't wait to tell theatrics. you about it. It's like the moon landing. You're using theatrics. <laughs> 
yeah. to cause a, a change in the way that people view reality. That's how you could say that it's really going on if it's an MK Ultra operation. And, you know, that's kind of what's going on in... Um, okay, so Kubrick films all, almost always have a partner, all right? So The Shining's partner is Eyes Wide Shut. Um, Clockwork Orange's partner is Full Metal Jacket. Um, so there, there's, there's these partners, and sometimes two films will have it. Uh, uh, Paths of Glory and Full Metal Jacket are also a pairing up. Um, and, and then he has Lolita. And then Lolita's got the same elements in it that uh, that both The Shining and Eyes Wide Shut have in it, which is a strange undercurrent of child abuse and, and secret societies and all the rest. So, you know, you got me really intrigued on this MK Ultra. Now I know who Lloyd is. Okay. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> it's wild when you think about it. That's why I was so excited to speak with you. I've been holding this in for a couple of days now. And it's really interesting too about, you know, eyes wide shut, because if you look at it in the way that, you know, Stanley was trying to let people know that he MK altered people to fake the moon landing. Right. And then eyes wide shut is kind of about him being involved in this group of people. And then he started having doubts about it. And he's kind of like, Oh man, I don't know if I want to continue to MK Ultra people anymore. Well, they would kill him, right? You would think that they would they would just take him out. If he doesn't want to be a part of the group anymore, they would just take him out, which I think should have been the real ending of Eyes Wide Shot. I think that Tom Cruise's character should have died. And then they switched it and they made it to where he got out with his family. What do you think about uh, that? Do you, do you have any knowledge of what the actual ending of Eyes Wide Shut was supposed to be? Yeah, the ending is, um, you know, uh, the, the uh, Tom and Nicole are walking down the Macy's aisle with their daughter in front of them. And um, uh, she's walking through all these teddy bears and other uh, toys that are all part of the symbolic code of certain groups. And at the very end, the very last shot, she's walking towards two men that are at the end of the aisle. Okay. Well, we've seen those two men before. Those two men are at the uh, a party uh, that Tom and Nicole go to. They're sitting in the back. They're at that party. So they're part of that group. And so I believe that Kubrick is saying that um you, you think you're safe you may be safe but your daughter isn't safe and um and, and all the connotations that that brings with it uh you know uh, uh, people all the time you know they go well why doesn't you know nancy pelosi's got you know 450 million dollars she's like 82 years old why does she continue to work right and the pro answer is, well, she's part of this mafia. But you can't get out. You can't quit. It's impossible. That's why Joe Biden's president. Uh, 80 years old to be president, nobody in their right mind would ever do that. But he can't quit. And I don't think you can quit. Once you're inside this mob, I don't think you can quit. And so, you know, I know it sounds outrageous, but I think that Elvis faked his death. I think Michael Jackson faked his death. I think John Lennon faked his death. I think a lot, James Dean faked his death. I think a lot of people have faked their death. And I've heard rumors that Stanley faked his death. The fact that he died 666 days exactly before January 1st, 2001, the date of the first day of the, his most famous movie, right? Uh, just tells me that there's something else going on here. And it was also six days after he showed the film to all of the actors, too. He uh, no, the Warner England. Brothers executives. Oh, yeah. Was it the executives? Yeah, who were seriously pissed off. And a, a huge argument ensued in which they told him he had to edit uh, 22 minutes or something of the movie out. And he said, I've got a contract. You can't tell me what to do. So go, yeah. <laughs> and... Um, and so, but, you know, he, he wasn't in good health either. I'm going to say that too. He was not in good health. He was a cigarette smoker and uh, he was 70 years old. And eventually, you know, you're going to meet your death with that kind of stuff. But we don't know. And the fact that he, again, 666 days before 2001 began, that's just like, hmm, that would be something that Kubrick would do. But here's the other, other wild part of this theory that I've heard. <laughs> 
And that is that he faked his death in order to uh, direct 9-11. Do you know that wow. the do you know, do you know the the newest building at the World Trade Center in 2001 was called the Millennial Building and it was shaped exactly like the black monolith of 2001? Seen that. Yeah. yeah. That's wild. I didn't put that connection together until now until you said that. <laughs> yeah. And uh, of course it happened in 2001. Um the movie, I mean 9/11 happened in 2001. Uh, the year that we were all going to be transformed, according to the movie, 2001. And um, uh, uh, just odd stuff that happened on 9-11. But I mean, I, I'm not saying that I, I agree with that theory, because I've also heard the theory that he directed the, the JFK assassination. So, I mean, everybody's got a theory, in it, you know, so I can't say yeah. that they're all right. But somebody directed 9-11. I don't know who it was, but it was directed and they used a lot of uh, special effects to get, <clears throat> to make it happen. Wow, that sounds just like who? Who faked something really important in history using special effects? The most famous oh. film director in history. Yep. And, you know, wow. it's just interesting. Just interesting. That's all I got to say. Wow, that is really interesting. I didn't even put the connection together that 2001 and then okay, so it happened in 2001 and it, the, the, the towers were kind of like a monument and then the monuments being destroyed. That's the change that would occur in 2001 as the buildings coming down. Wow. Okay, so um, uh, in 1967, the year that the World Trade Center was approved to be built, um, Mel Brooks, the famous film director, was uh, not a famous film director yet. He was doing a show called Get Smart, which was a really silly uh, a spoof on James Bond, kind of. And um, it was actually a pretty funny show. And um, he wrote and directed this episode called The Walls of Jericho Coming Down. And in the episode, Max is told by the chief that every time this one company builds a building, it falls apart. And they've got to be worried because they're building a new building that's going to house the uh, space program. And they don't want the space program to fall apart. So Max has to go there and find out why their buildings are always falling apart. So Max goes there. The building is called the Odyssey. No kidding. Same year that Stanley changed the name of his movie from Voyage Beyond the Stars to 2001 A Space Odyssey. For sure, Mel and Stanley knew each other. They grew up in the village. They're both Jewish. They played chess at the at the um, at the park there. Uh, for sure, they knew each other. All the filmmakers knew each other in, in New York um, because they were all poor. And so I think that somehow, so that turns out, Max finds out that the building is putting explosives in the buildings. The construction company is putting explosives in the buildings while they're building it. And that's how they're able to blow up the buildings. And that's the end of the episode. But it's just a curious set of coincidences that the building is called the Odyssey. It's housing the space program. Uh, the buildings are falling apart. Uh, the company is an evil company. It's putting the bombs inside the buildings. And all that would be all right, except that... Um, oh, I'm going to forget his name. Uh, 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 sorry for me forgetting your name. Uh, this one conspiracy theorist actually interviewed the uh, second in line architect of the um, of the World Trade Center, and he said, "Yes, we put plastic explosives in the building because we knew one day we would have to tear it down." Wow. Yep. So I don't know what to make of all that. You know. Um, you know, you look at like the ending of Fight Club, um, the Twin Towers going down. Oh, I've seen you. Mm -hmm. We just really got got under, you know, and also the uh, symbolic symbolic nature of nine eleven. Um, the uh, um, the two towers are Yoakum and Boaz, and the Pentagon. These are the three main symbols of Freemasonry. For sure, Kubrick was probably a Freemasonry. Freemason. <clears throat> so did he have something to do with it? I don't know, but there are a lot of coincidences. Wow, that's incredible. Especially when you think about the holographs, if those planes were really holograms. 
That would be something mm-hmm. that Kubrick would really be into. Absolutely. I agree. There's so much, uh, so much subtext, so many things going on in these films. And I think that he was a legit master and I, and I'm in full agreement that he, because there was a lot of, there was a rumor. I don't know if it's true or not that Stanley Kubrick called the manager of the uh, Stanley hotel and talked to him for hours and hours and hours and said that he was going to, he was thinking about filming the shining at the Stanley and that he wanted to send a research team out. And apparently this research team went to the Stanley uh, photographed everything, took video and did all this study and like all this research. And apparently they also went to Denver to do all this study and like, all this research. And I think that that, I don't think that Stanley had any plans to actually film the shining at the Stanley in Colorado. He was just doing that research to figure out how he wanted to make his film and how he wanted to make his sets and what he wanted it to look like. <laughs> no, you're exactly right. I talked to uh, Leon, the guy that did all that for uh, Stanley. And he told me that's exactly right. He was doing it to help him with the script, to get used to what the hotels were, and uh, he went to many hotels, by the way, this crew. They didn't just go to the Stanley. That was the first place they went, but they went to many hotels. And, um, you know, that's when Kubrick, you know, saw that hotels have that really abstract looking carpet. And then he started realizing that he could use that to his advantage by making his own abstraction, which was actually Launchpad 39A uh, at Cape Canaveral. Uh, and uh, so, you know, I don't know. I'm more intrigued with it as an MK Ultra program now than I am as a, uh, <laughs> because it would fold in really neatly with the whole moon launch, moon fakery. Because yeah. that would be, the moon fakery was actually the first time, well, no, the Kennedy assassination was the first time that they realized that they could pull off a huge amount of fakery. But the moon landing was when they did it on this epic scale, and they realized they could fake anything, anywhere, anytime. Yeah, because the JFK Zapruder film wasn't released at all, I don't believe, until 1969. And, uh, and it was a crappy version, so you couldn't yeah. really see it. I, the really good version didn't get released until 1994, when Oliver Stone released his super uh, version, which is interesting. I want to get on this before we go. We we did a, a show, of course, on the Zapruder film, in which I showed yeah. that Kennedy put a a squib on his cheek and Jackie helped him blow it off and he faked his death. And we didn't get the response that I thought we'd get, but I remember the time thinking, okay, coming November 22nd, it's so one more time. They're going to revisit John F. Kennedy. Now up until 2022, they've been kind of backing off of all the Kennedy celebrations and anniversaries. And it's just kind of fading its way into history. But then all of a sudden, like a week before the anniversary, Tucker's got the CIA on, and all of a sudden, everybody's blaming the CIA who denied it all the time. And of course, we know the CIA didn't do it. They may have helped in the cover-up, but they didn't have anything to do with the assassination because there was no assassination. But it's just interesting how they did a limited hangout on the whole thing. The very first person to appear was Oliver Stone. About a week after our show, he came on Joe Rogan. It's about two hours talking about the JFK assassination, right? And we proved in our show that um, he cut out two vital seconds of the Zabruder film, showing them the uh, squib for two full seconds. You can see the squib on his cheek and he cut that out. So he knew what he was doing. And um, and he, I think he he went into alert when um, when he saw our show. I really do. I think he went into alert. He went on Joe Rogan, demanded to go on there, got get as much credibility back as he could. And it's it's such a interesting, you, you know, we're talking about MK Ultra. Well, that show should have blown everybody away. But because they've already got it in their head that he was assassinated, even people like dark journalists who are usually pretty good, he can't see it. I sent him the link. Watch this. You're wrong. You know, you're wrong. You're just wrong. You know, and and nobody can see it. And uh, they don't know what to make of the version that we showed. And I don't know if we'll ever be able to break through the mind control. I don't think so either. And that's an interesting thing that you brought up too, was that because dark journalist, dark journalist, shit, I can't even say his name, dark journalist 
thinks that the reason that they don't release the all of the JFK documents is because it has something to do with UFOs and all that. And I'm like, uh, I don't think so. I think that there's something way more deeper. And I am with Jay on this. I think that they're not going to release it because it tells everybody that he faked his death. And that's the mind blowing thing. Because remember, Trump uh, told that uh, judge that he couldn't ever uh, he could never release. release it because it's too damaging. It would make people go, you know, out of their minds. I'm like, that is literally the only thing because people are already aware of UFOs. People already think that the government's covering up aliens and all that stuff. That wouldn't be that shocking. No. Now, what would be shocking is that JFK faked his death and he wasn't assassinated. And it's in those documents. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, and there's no doubt about it. You can clearly see in the film that M.K. Davis made that um, uh, that that it's fake. And so then, you know, the question becomes, well, why would someone who is, you know, young, 43 years old, got a beautiful wife and president of the United States, why would he quit and uh, the job and fake his dad? And well, we just talked about it. Once you get in, you can't get out. He probably tried to get out and said, no, you can't get out. There's no way to get out. And then he finds out that, you know, several uh, FBI reports are reporting that the uh, Chicago mob has a hit out on him, right? He's mentioning the hit to several people, how worried he is about getting hit, right? Um, and then he fakes his hit and uh, uh, and gets away with it and then goes off someplace and all the troubles go away. I really encourage anyone that wants to see that uh I think is it still on your channel too, or yep. did they take yep. it down? A new look at the yeah. Zipruder film. No, I'm never taking it down. No <laughs> fantastic, fantastic yeah. show. It's still on my channel too. I think it's called Ascension and the Zacruder film with uh with Jay Weiner. I very highly encourage people to check that out because uh we I think we do a great analysis and a great job uh exposing that whole thing. Well, we we all we, we as really if you watch that with an open mind, then it exposes the entire theatrics of all of it. You know, yeah, that's the thing. Okay, so why would they uh, fake the moon landing if they could fake a president getting shot in the head, right? <laughs> and they did. Uh, they must have been really empowered. I purpose per, I I have gone back and looked at several incidences in the past that I remember being weird and wild. Uh, incidences and I've gone back and I've looked at video and read the newspaper articles and all this stuff one in particular is a shootout at McDonald's and I believe the early 80s it, it's, it's so obvious that it was fake it was so obvious mm -hmm. even the blood looks fake the, the thing that they that they screw up on here is that if they use stage blood right it looks real but when it dries it dries cherry red not rust colored whereas human blood dries rust colored. So you can go look at the picture taken in the back seat of the Parkland Hospital of the blood on the back seat, and it's two hours or two and a half hours after the shot, and it's all cherry red, all of the blood. It wouldn't be. It would be rust colored. It would, it'll turn rust colored within 45 minutes. So uh, and same thing with the, the Boston bombing, the photographs of the people that got shot there. Two hours later, it's still cherry red. All the blood is still on the sidewalk. It's still cherry red. It hasn't taught, gone rust color. That's how you know these things. You, there's a certain things that give it away. And, yeah, and uh, another thing that I brought up. Dave in that, McGowan. Uh, Dave McGowan is the guy that wrote the Laurel Canyon. And he also wrote the best thing about the Boston bombings, which he wrote right before he died. And another thing that I said in that interview that uh, Zagruder film and uh, Ascension of Zagruder film was that the Boston bombing, there was a third bomb yeah. that went off. It wasn't just two. There was a third one, and that happened at the JFK Memorial Library in the archives department uh, in Boston, yeah. <laughs> right? I think that that whole thing was a, was a cover to eliminate whatever was at the archives department at the JFK Memorial Library, which probably had something to do with uh, JFK faking his death and there was documentation of it. So they just, the, the cover story was the Boston bombing and they just went and took out the JFK Memorial Library. Yeah, most people don't realize that. That's quite fascinating. I bet you're right. I bet you're right. But they're removing documents. Yep. Yeah. Well, they can never let us know because once they let us know that JFK did that, then, you know, your, your, for your paradigm is forever shifted and they can't hold that fear over you anymore. 
Exactly. Thanks so much, Jay. I appreciate yeah. you and your time here. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope everyone else enjoyed it. Can you let people know where they can find you online, plug your uh, YouTube channel or website? Or yeah, yeah. Uh, like Jaywidener.com uh, and sacredmysteries.com for my films and then Reality Check on YouTube, which is where I do my uh, shows and uh, where you can find the Zabruder film. Thanks so much. The links to all of Jay's information will be in the description of this video highly recommend his channel and his work and check out our uh that ascension in uh zucruder film video and for everyone else thanks for watching listening much love to everyone in the chat please be sure to hit the thumbs up button to help the channel in the youtube algorithm share subscribe hit the bell icon as well for notifications and the links to all of my information is also in the description and remember we're not only in a spiritual war but a war on humanity stay aware stay alert keep loving your heart for everyone stay safe out there and if you can see through the illusion you are the solution. See you guys next.